is what we're dealing with right now. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Thought contagion. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's nice when it's comedy thought contagion. Yeah, I'll exactly. Take that. Yeah. that I like. There are some Maybe of those classic day. Saturday Night Live bits that are just really, really oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, the Coneheads. <laughs> We're from France. We are from France. Yes. France. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, welcome to Solid Ground Live, uh, Monday, February 12th. And we have Karen King with us today to talk about an ideological oasis resource for counseling interns. And so we're really excited to hear more about that and glad you're here with us, Karen. And we also want to start something new. We've, we we had one episode where we recorded um, prior to Christmas and we did a bunch of viewer comments and it really felt good to include those viewer comments and have some commentary around them. So we're going to start doing some reading of some viewer comments. We'll save that to the end of the stream. So about, about five or 10 tell we'll, we'll break from the discussion and, and pay a little attention to what people have been saying from past episodes. Um, and Jennifer and I are hosting, we're, we're expanding our solid ground group offerings. So we're going to be hosting a support group for parents of trans identified youth. And that's beginning on March 4th. So get in touch with us if you're interested in that. You can email me through my website or you can go to solid ground support and get in touch with, with us through solid ground support at uh, dot com or email us at solid ground peers at gmail. And Deborah, do you have the blurb handy to tell people? Of course, people who I don't Solid because Ground I went. To, I just went to look for the the other thing, and now I have to go find it because the. Anyway, I can only you... see one thing on my phone at the time, so now I have to go find the other thing. Does anybody else have, like, know it off the top of their head? Maybe Jennifer. Jennifer, can you ad lib who I'll, Solid I'll, Ground I'll is? Ad lib. Good. Solid Ground is a peer support community dedicated to helping people navigate the, devi the divisive impacts of oppressive ideologies. And you can join us at solidgroundsupport.com. For just $5 a month, you can post on our locals, view everything on our locals, and you can join a group. We have three groups running per week, and they're drop-in, so people can drop in, um, meet other people that share their concerns, and form community. Oh, and the disclaimer, <laughs> nothing in the group should con constitutes legal advice or psychotherapy, nor should it be construed as such. And sorry about my dogs in the background. They're making what I call their dinosaur sound. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a dog friendly group? It's, it's a dog, dog friendly, friendly group. Yeah. Bring your pets. You can have a parrot on your shoulder or whatever you want. It's all good. <laughs> Excellent. That's awesome. Yeah. And we've been doing some expanding of our groups. I know Deborah's hosting an additional group some weeks and um, I, I hope we get to continue to play with format and, and, you know, expand as, as demand expands. So, um, so Karen, I am so excited to hear more about ideological oasis. This is something that has been troubling me for that. That's been the reason that I've been doing these YouTube videos, the the way that ideology is impacting the education and training of psychology professionals. And so you have come up with something to help. And I'll just leave it to you. Why don't you introduce <laughs> what <laughs> this is? I hope it's helpful. Um, yeah. But first of all, thank you all so much for this time and also for what you do. Is this year, this is the beginning of the second year, right? So the yep. just amazing work. And I feel um, I've been talking about this with other groups I'm part of, but that you all have really laid the groundwork for people like me to step forward and feel supported and feel like there's a community that will have my back um, in case, and I will get pushed back for what I'm doing. So thank you for the work you've done. But ideologicaloasis.com uh, is the website and it, it came out of having a clinic during the pandemic, uh, I employed and still do 20 counselors and ARNPs uh, for counseling and psychiatry. And I started to notice something was happening <laughs> to the counselors that I have, was hiring. And through that shift, which was really challenging and um, not to use the T word too much, but traumatic, um, 
I really had to reflect on what was happening. And then I, my eyes started opening to all the things that were happening in our larger culture. And I realized that after meeting people through solid ground and critical therapy antidote, that there was this huge missing piece that interns and people postgraduate needed. They needed sane placements with a classical Western psychological philosophical concepts um, and not that it, they were embedded in these ideologically rigid um, placements where they were really struggling. And then also interns needed a placement while they're in school. And I was approached by an intern this year that really sort of concretized the whole thing. And I started an internship program for the first time. And then um, I hired six LMHCAs, so associates that needed supervision and realized that I was involved in a disindoctrination program and that that's what I was actually mm -hmm. running. And it's become my single purpose. <laughs> it's so inspiring to watch them grow and um, have these difficult conversations. It's scary as hell, but it's really, um, it's been amazing. And I, I'm, I'm just new at it, but I feel like it's a skill I want to develop. And so I want to put it out there and start learning with people. And um, so, yeah, I feel very morally obligated to do this for whatever reason. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Wow. That's, is it, do you find that you're being approached by interns or LMHCAs that are specifically concerned with these issues? Or do you find that you're just dealing with people who come in, not thinking about ideology at all, just thinking that they've gotten a, a good education and you're kind of starting from square one? Well, I would say it's a, it's a mixture um, mm -hmm. my intern found me because he had met me through this platform and so knew of my non-ideological stance. And then the other folks I interviewed and hired and what there was a quality in them that I felt like they could be molded and disindoctrinated. And there were a lot of people I interviewed that I don't think uh, could be. And so... Mm -hmm. Also, I think the trouble is like people are just hearing about me. So now that people are hearing about me, I'm getting lots mm -hmm. of calls and and emails weekly, um, which I hope continues because I think we need a network of supervisors to provide this all over the country for people, mm -hmm. um, which I, I don't mind creating a database for and helping with that because I, I really feel like we it's our responsibility as elders in the field that we need to really help protect these what I really see them, I was I was talking with um Stephanie Wynn last week, and and I was realizing that I have this feeling that so many of these counselors went into grad school for the right reasons. They really want to help people, they're thoughtful, they've been through something themselves, and they encounter this ideology that they just don't know to question. And they're young, they're idealistic. And so um it feels like a naivete to me and the, a lot of, there's a lot of innocence um, even in the emotional pushback I think because they're scared to hear something new um, mm -hmm. so that's what I'm finding at least with the group that I have now is they're mm -hmm. very open to being questioned and they're looking for a place to actually it's like they look around and say oh well actually I don't agree can I ask this question and um, I'm giving them the space to do that which I think is probably new for them do you work with them just individually or do you do any supervision where they're all meeting collectively? It's a great question. I do both. So, um, and the main reason, so it's interesting, like the, the gateway for me has been my psychedelic work. Every new therapist I've ever met or heard of wants to be trained in psychedelic assisted therapy. So when they see that I'm a MAPS trained psychedelic assisted therapist running an integrated clinic, I want us to be one of the first to offer MDMA um, and be site approved. Like we're working for that. They get excited and that's the doorway they enter. Um, and so I have an ethos where we need to be a, a tight community and we need to learn from each other. If we're doing co-therapy, which is a very unique model and is the one that is going to be approved by the FDA because uh, psychedelic work is so long. It's five to six hours. 
So you really have to have two therapists in the room. We need to have a really um, thoughtful, intelligent, safe, I, I hate to use that word, um, but truly safe as in like diversity of opinion, safe uh, group. So we do weekly group supervision. And then I also do biweekly long form co-supervision. So it's, um, it's pretty immersive in that way. Mm -hmm. What are the qualities you're seeing in students or, or incoming therapists that you think make them more open to being de-indoctrinated? <laughs> yeah. And what is the term? Is it D or dis? Is it, are we making it up? I don't have no idea. <laughs> Good question. I have no idea. Um, Counter indoctrinated. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Uh, re indoctrinated yeah. into open thinking. I don't know what to call it, but so deprogrammed. Deprogrammed. Yeah, that's that's really cl clearly what's happening. You know, it's there's a contrast. I would say in the pandemic, it was a very different crew of folks, and it's it's. I would. I'm looking forward to studies being done about this. There was this anonymity because we we hired 10 associates online who never met us in person and never came to our site. And uh, we keep them or hold them in uh, like supportively in the life of their associateship. So it was about a two year process for most of them. And they never met us in person. And that was the most contentious, difficult um, indoctrinated group of employees I've ever worked with. And I feel like we, we were almost taken down by our cancel culture employees. It was very tough. And then with the second wave of people that I just hired in August of 2023, we're all in person. And that has made the difference. Um, and, and they have done their, um, because of their age and the life of their program, they've had at least some in-person graduate school. And so that's one of the main things I've noticed is the, the indoctrination was off the charts, victimhood, mm -hmm. all of that um, uh, CRT, CSJ in the pandemic with online only. But once we had uh, invited grad post-grad students that had had some kind of human contact, had worked in person in a practicum, had actually met with clients in person, I just call them saner. They're just mm -hmm. saner. They have um, a, a, a more willing grasp of reality, um, mm -hmm. of their own limitations. Um, you know, I I could give so many examples. Like there was, there's this classic example of the first time it it popped its head in um, supervision. Uh, when I say it, I mean the ideology, the capital I. And I I said, oh, Jung might say, as in Carl Jung. And my supervisee interrupted me and said, oh, young Jung, it doesn't matter what we call him. He's an old, rich, white man. And he probably misnamed minorities all around him. And I oh, was like, wow, he probably, okay. wow. Yeah, I was like, okay, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> we're, wow. we're right in there. And my, my technique at that moment and what I've developed more is to zoom out mm -hmm. and say, oh, that's so interesting. You took that from a philosophical, psychological perspective into a power perspective. How does that help? Help me understand that. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, it was like, well, you know, white people, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, oh, so that's a power perspective too. How does that, how does that connect to the collective unconscious? And so I'm I'm trying to slowly help them think about the center of their meaning making actually being psychology so that they can go, they can recognize this is an overlay. So you're off, you're suggesting right. like, let's look at the process that you're using yeah. and not get derailed by the thing that you're bringing up. We're going to talk exactly. about process. Yeah. I feel like Peter Bogosian is right, is onto it. I feel like I'm doing street epistemology basically every, every day I am mm -hmm. helping clinicians make meaning of how they're making meaning of the world. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm asking them to challenge each other and, um, and they are, they're challenging each other and there's a lot of apology and there's a lot of fear, um, but they're doing it and they're having great conversations without me, which is, I think one of the, the best things I've noticed. So I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but there's a humility that I felt, and I mean, maybe it comes with the sample population of therapists that want to become psychedelic practitioners is they've mm -hmm. already done psychedelic exploring 
or if not, they're curious about it. Um, so that may, that may skew the, the population a bit. You know, it's interesting that you bring up, and I almost feel like it's a, it's so obvious. And yet I think it's not being talked about enough. This, the impact that online, uh, the mediation of the screen coming between people has had, and, and you've you witnessed this in terms of the quality of interactions and the hostility yes. of the interactions that you describe with your yeah. online only interns and yeah. also the quality of their education when it was just coming from the screen, their willingness to adopt certain mm -hmm. dehumanizing attitudes towards other people yeah. through their training. And then their willingness to treat you in a way that's um, that th this entire process, like this is, there's a haughtiness, there's a disrespect. Yeah. It's really interesting. I, I, and this is the same thing that I feel like I observe in online uh, communities yeah. often. And, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. we don't, I don't know, I, there's like, there's the text based online and then there's the video conferencing, which seems to bring it up a level in terms of human interaction, but none of it compares to in person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're really seeing now are the real results of a social contagion because of the pandemic and being forced to be online. I mean, these were therapists through no fault of their own that had never met with a client in person. And this was, their wow. first, yeah, this is in 2021 and they had done school online. Their internships were online, mm -hmm. their uh, practicums were online, and then they got their first professional job, which was online because of lockdowns. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I mean, I think Yako, I can't remember his last name, the CTA Until, expert. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. In, in psychodynamic theory and mm -hmm. psychoanalytic theory would have mm -hmm. so much to say about this that I'm not knowledgeable in, but the amount of projection mm -hmm. that could happen mm -hmm. and the speed of it, I mean, talk about the, I mean, I'm, it, Whereas we had been open since 2017 mm -hmm. and had interns and or associates until that point. And there was always the assumption that um, we were there to help them have great jobs. And we were there as employers. Uh, they gave us the benefit of the doubt, like, oh, this doesn't feel good. But I know Karen and Stephen, my husband and I own the practice, are working on it. Or um, there was a generosity because there was a humanity. There was an exchange. And then that just disappeared um, pretty much June of 2020 and employee attitudes just took a hard turn and mm -hmm. we became the focus of their animosity because we were the oppressor. So <laughs> they had um, learned in school that if psychology is a, a power differential, then inevitably there are going to be an employee that has an oppressive boss if they've really absorbed all of these things. And that's mm -hmm. what we we really experienced in a, a profound way. I can remember me... the first time it happened actually. And please ask me questions if you want, but I, I do you mind if I just share this? Cause it was so the, the it was a shocking moment for me when um, I had a young Gen Z office manager who was very well-meaning and she wanted to post the black square. Mm -hmm. And oh, for your social media for the for office? social media. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I said, no. And I said, I don't, I don't understand what the black square is. I actually don't have enough information about the situation. This was like 24 hours after George Floyd. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, we no, I'm, we're not a political organization. This is not, we're not going to take a stance on this and I don't have enough information. And it was the first time I noticed there was this overwhelming wave of needing to be political. Um, mm -hmm. in our organization. And then the next week, I asked our new psychiatric nurse practitioner if she would be comfortable running a group to like a like a, a depression, a stress group for people that were really experiencing a lot of sadness and stress over the marches and the riots and just a support group. And she um, accused me of being a racist and using my white privilege to force her into something. And um, she happened to be African-American and I was stunned. I often ask my employees to run groups, <laughs> whatever color, race, gender, whatever they are, sex, you know, um, and they can always say no, but I thought it would be a great idea. And, and she pushed back and said, I was using my power and privilege. And that was the first time I had ever heard those terms. And I sat back and I was like, okay, 
am I, you know, I had to really question, is this, is this white privilege? Is, and I really took it in and I thought, no, this is not, this has nothing to do with race. This is about asking a new clinician to take a risk and run a group. And she might be outside of her, her comfort zone and we'll support her. And I would do it with anyone. Um, and she later apologized. She said she was sorry. She was caught up in the fervor of the riots and the marches, which I really appreciated. She took ownership of that, but that was the first inclination. And then I just have so many stories of how that devolved into persecuting and strange behaviors with clients. And hmm. so it, this it willingness to accuse yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Which you know, I, I saw reflected in their work with clients, you know, if, if this was happening and, and the, their boss, let's say, or their organization was the bad guy, um, they could vilify us and ally with their clients. And I think that is the whole point is they were taught, I call it the activist influenced therapist, right? Is they're taught to ally with like the friend that says, who do I need to hate? feels really good for a while when you have that friend with you who's like, yeah, they're bad. They're terrible. They shouldn't have done that to you. But then after a while, you want the friend to come in who says, hey, why do you think this keeps happening? <laughs> Is there something you're doing? <laughs> you know, Let's solve this. Um, but they're stuck in this, who do I need to hate for you mentality? Mm -hmm. And it's not therapy, obviously. Mm -hmm. Deborah, you were going to say something. Yeah, so yeah. I'm trying to remember about that. I have I had two thoughts. One was just on, and it, it, maybe you were when you said Karen, maybe they'd study this. Is I don't know if we project more the less we're having embodied experience. I don't know. It's fascinating to me that 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 this is becoming a, or just Twitter becomes such yeah. a huge projection machine. The other thing I was just musing on, maybe it's where you were sort of going with having people who have been drawn to do psychedelic therapy. I don't know if you're getting people who to some extent have had some meta awareness. I mean, right. they through their journeys, maybe they meditate. I don't know. But then if anyone's had an experience where they've been able to observe something yeah. bigger than their own minds, then they would be much more yeah. open to what you're talking about. So that's, yeah. I, that's really interesting. I think that that's a draw and that's more likely to get you people that you can then proceed to undoctrinate. Isn't it? I think, and I think you just named something. I just recognized this this week that what I keep hearing myself say to them is remember that you're the one in the room holding reality. Ooh. You're the one holding the big picture reality and you're gently touching their subjective reality enough to ally with it to bring them into objective reality. And it's, I realize, oh, I'm saying this over and over because I'm seeing them. I think I thought it was developmental at first. Um, and I'm realizing, oh, this is developmental and is philosophical. That they are very swayed. What I've noticed in general is that they're very swayed when the client is swayed by their own experience and they're drawn into it. And they're, they report to me like, I don't know what to do. She was, she was quiet and wouldn't say anything, you know, which is a normal developmental process as a therapist. And then you help the, the supervisee sit with their discomfort, allow something to arise in the room. Um, notice their heart rates increased, you know, all the things that come with being present with someone, but they feel like they need to be doing something and to, to um, lower the distress, lower the distress. And it's like, no, we need to learn that pain is actually transformative. Let's sit in that together and learn from the pain, not try to, you know, uh, dismiss it away or medicate it or do a technique or a DBT acronym, CBT, DBT, you know, <laughs> let's, let's be in that, what is it? Healthy adversity um, that so many social psychologists, psychologists talk about is we need that healthy adversity. So, and, and it's a meta process because I have to help the supervisees sit in the adversity for themselves of not knowing what to do. And that's, that's right where they need to be. They don't have to know what to do, actually. When you said that you at first thought it was developmental, is it something mm -hmm. that you were observing in people that you worked with prior to all of this ideology? Is this just sort of a process that you see as a supervisor? 
Yes. Although there was a definitely a different quality to this. That's why I was like, oh, this is just that developmental thing where someone feels like, oh, I have to do something. Um, where's my toolbox? I need more worksheets. You know, that's a normal process, I think. But this, this there's a quality of anxiety to it. That's like, I'm not the expert in the room. I need someone to come in and help. And, and I'm helping them recognize actually it's you, you're the expert in the room <laughs> and there's no one to come in and save you from that distress. Like, you know, enough, you actually know enough. Hmm. And, um, but the, it's the emotional quality that they immediately run to. I need a training or, um, I need a diagnosis. Maybe they're neurodiverse. You know, they're these very, um, prolific labels that maybe make it more comfortable for the therapist as well as the client. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, I guess it is so many things. I, I <laughs> wonder, uh, yeah, how, how do you think that this ideological oasis or this, this mm. ability to question and dialogue around these issues and the ability to observe process helps after the fact when a student mm. has already been through a really ideological training. Yeah, I guess it's like asking, you know, what, how does a cult member return to themselves after yeah. being part of a cult is, is really helping them recognize reality. Mm -hmm. Again, it's that reality based, recognizing their own thinking. Um, and, and really uh, calling to and trusting much like I do with my clients the natural intelligence of the reason they entered the field and okay. cultivating a trust in that so that they can trust that in themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to interact with people as if they are um, intelligent, professional, capable, just like I interact with my clients as I'm a solution focused historically. So they know how to solve their problem. They just need an expert in change to come in and help them see the different perspectives. And I think I, I see I'm appealing to the, the natural intelligence mm -hmm. and, and making room for that. And are you finding, I'm sorry, oh, okay. are, you, are you finding that the students seem well enough trained overall or that a lot mm. of their training has been supplanted by uh, the new like critical social justice ideology? Yeah, that's hard. I'm not sure if I have a comparison enough yet. Um mm -hmm. What I see is they're attuning deeply to their clients. Mm -hmm. They are um, really aspiring to help them. And uh, I see maybe, and maybe it is really, you know what it is? I was thinking about it this morning. I've started reading The Canceling of the American Mind and it's really helping me sort of categorize what the, the indoctrination process um, the rhetoric he talks about, I think mm -hmm. therapists probably went through this. Leslie, yourself being one of them is the, the impenetrable rhetoric is I think they have less confidence because they were not allowed to ask questions in mm -hmm. grad school mm -hmm. for fear of being canceled. Mm. And so I think that's what I'm really seeing is they, they have something and they know it doesn't quite fit and it doesn't quite feel right, but they don't know that they can ask hey, I disagree with this thing that I've been told. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And um, I think that it, they're coming forward slowly with the, um, with the confidence because they're seeing, okay, I actually can disagree. And there are disagreements within our group mm -hmm. and they're still connected, which is the big learning process. They're not getting canceled in a group. Well, I think that one of the things that you're that 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 gets to is the idea that I think that a lot of relationship is about intuition and about trusting mm. what mm. you're feeling between you and another person. And when you're not allowed to ask questions or when you're being told things that are that you clearly feel go against a value structure that you've learned or don't seem mm. right, but you have to sit with them and not ask or if you're shouted yeah. down even worse then what you've been, then what's happened to you is you've been trained to not trust your intuition. You've yeah. been trained a, yeah. away from your own intuitive understanding. So how damaging yeah. to someone who's trying to hone and learn to trust their relational intuition. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder what, what you're, I mean, when you speak to a lack of confidence, I, yeah. that's what, that's what I think of. 
I think you named it really well. And it's making me recognize too um, and remember just, so I have six and out of six, two of them reported are just starting to reveal these negative experiences in grad school where they were actually targeted for being racist or biased or, or told they needed counseling because of their questioning of a subject matter. So they're, you know, we're only six months in and they're barely recognizing that I'm not a supervisor who's going to be admonishing of them if they disagree with me. So this is a really, it's a slow process of building trust. Mm -hmm. I'm also seeing how, I mean, how, oh, sorry. You want to go ahead, Jen? Oh, I was just going to say that the whole idea of being afraid in school to ask questions, I hadn't thought much about, about that outside of the classroom. But now I'm thinking when you're a clinician, you spend so much time with a client asking them questions as part of the exploration. And you're also always checking in with yourself and kind of asking yourself things about your own responses and where you're at so that you're fully present with the person and you're not mm-hmm. kind of coming at it from a weird angle or non-productive <laughs> angle. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost like questioning is what we do. Yeah. And to, yeah. to be taught when you're vulnerable, because students are really vulnerable. They're all kind of eager beavers trying to do a good job. You want to please your professors. You don't want to piss off your supervisors and to be afraid of questioning as a student, but especially in a field where you are going to be questioning all the time. uh, That just really hit me that that's so um, destructive to what we do in our profession. It's so sad. And, um, you know, the tears that have been shed in my office is they talk about how they were targeted by administrators or their professors um, in front of the group. Yeah. Is oh, this- God, I'm so of sorry course. to hear that. And of course. It's, it's the terrible. Shaming. That's how you make an example of them yeah. and you nip them back in the That's right. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. and then you teach yeah. everybody who's witnessing that. Oh, yeah. look what happened when they yeah. raised a question. That's I guess like, I better shut up. Yeah. Yeah. It's cult 101. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Yeah, it is. Which tells me, I mean, just to spin this is that the people that made it through grad school that are coming to me, you know, they were determined to get their license and they Mm -hmm. have a a sort of, not that you weren't Leslie, but they have. (laughs) No, I wasn't. I I gave up on that because I looked at it and I decided it wasn't worth it to me. And yeah. they, so I know that they're, they are determined enough in this particular, they want to learn these skills. Mm-hmm. And that is really what I'm appealing to in them is the, mm-hmm. um, their vision. And I want to help facilitate that because I believe it's their original vision, you know, mm-hmm. and somehow along the way they, they got attacked and they made it through. I really do think psychedelics because they have so much promise and they're new and they um, are mysterious and they also are somewhat mystical and they show really great research results. All of that combines with this kind of, it's like a, um, a pot of gold at the end. If you're really into that, um, that work, you feel like, oh, that's the reward is mm-hmm. I get to do the psychedelic work. And I think that's maybe what mm-hmm. helps them navigate I shape. can see that because mm-hmm. it would be a thing that isn't accessible otherwise. And yeah. I think what I I think what you're doing is really important because I think it fills in an important piece of this of the need that's here. And I think that for myself, as I was going through this training and making decisions mm-hmm. about my future, one of the things that that made it okay for me to let go of the licensure is that I have so many other criticisms of the way mental health is being approached yeah. right now. Yeah, that I didn't for lots of reasons, I didn't see myself working within that paradigm. And I also never wanted to take insurance. So there's all these things, but had I wanted to work specifically with psychedelics, Mm -hmm. you, you either have to do something that's very underground and questionable for lots of reasons, or you have to go this particular route. So there's, it, it is true that you have to have a very clear goal here. Yeah. I think that's really what has facilitated their perseverance of, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm the BS because <laughs> they just, came from many different programs around the state. Deborah, you I'm just, yeah, I'm just reflecting on, it seems like authentic connection to oneself and one's knowing mm. Trump's can Trump ideology. And if we can mm. get, yeah. it can help people have that experience, direct them 
yeah. that way yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and have, because I feel like they might be even using it as a shield. Like I have this ideology, it's my shield. I just wield it wherever I go when I'm mm-hmm. safe behind the shield. But if they actually have something that's more substantial, more, but that's really the empowered thing, right? Is to actually mm-hmm. come from your own knowing and sensing in the attunement. So if you're leading them into, into that, that I can see how that can be like the remedy for letting the ideology aside. Cause you're like, wait a minute, this really feels more yeah. real or true or I, where I'm operating from. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about how true that is for cult indoctrination or de-indoctrination deprogramming mm-hmm. is um, it's constant reality checks. And do I really feel that to be true? Is that what I believe? Is that in my body? What's my response mm-hmm. to that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that that asking, I feel this very strongly and I'm having a big reaction, but they are too. So yeah. is there a question here about, am I, am I the wrong? Am I in the wrong? So just yeah. being willing to go in and, and investigate that over and yeah. over again, reality checking. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that one of the, the, best tools as a therapist is our humility. And that Mm -hmm. when people come out of a program that is um, advocacy influenced is or ally influenced is they lose the humility because they become the the owner of the knowledge that must be imparted to the therapist, to the client. Mm -hmm. And that is just not what therapy is, as we all No, you know, it is a humble exploration of someone's making meaning of their own experiences Mm -hmm. and being with them in that and helping them untangle any confusions around that. Mm -hmm. It's the humility of that process that's so um, important. And of course, you know, all that research, I don't know if it's replicable, maybe you all know this, but the research that says um, 70% of the outcome in therapy is based on the relationship. Yeah. It's not a yeah. technique or a, you know, it's the, it's the process, it's the rapport the and room. the relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, um, listened to this, it was a Benjamin's recent interview with a doctor. I think his last name is Jeff Jets. I was it's just a, listening to that. Did you yeah. listen to it? Not, not the whole thing. Oh, it's it. so mm-hmm. good. This guy is really I really enjoyed listening to him. I thought he was yeah. saying uh, a lot of things that just resonated very deeply with me. But one of the things that they ended up discussing was this idea that in in our medical model, it we're all about reducing suffering. And so mm-hmm. suffering could even be just subjective, emotional. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. give it a, here, take a pill, here, do this, and yeah. here, have a surgery because you're, you need, you know, and so it's all about, They've so, sort of uh, perverted the idea of do no harm mm. to prevent all harm yeah. and mm. and suffering being a subjective experience of harm. And so when you were talking about mm-hmm. um, adversity being therapeutic, yeah, I thought that that was really interesting. And it's, mm-hmm. it's a, a good counterpoint to this prevailing perspective on immediate alleviation of any discomfort. Yeah. I mean, the pain, the going through the pain is the transformation, not medicating the pain or ignoring the pain or pretending it's not there. We all see what happens when we do those avoidance techniques. There's addiction, there's, you know, suffering, there's depression, anxiety, but going through it, facing it with someone, understanding it differently, coming through to the other side creates that what is it? Cognitive flexibility and resilience, like Jordan Peterson talks about all the time that, that there's a healthy level of adversity. Um, I have listened to so many podcasts. I can't remember who said what, I think it might've been Nina power talking about this, that, um, you know, there's a healthy level of adversity that if we don't have, then we create pathologies. And it, I, I always think of it as like a hunger game situation. <laughs> we, we need that kind of, regular day-to-day adversity so that we can have a grounded embodied human life and have good relationships and be in civil society. But if we're so separated from that and we have luxury beliefs and we have immediate Amazon deliveries and our, our immediate needs are gratified, we don't develop that distress tolerance window that is so necessary for overcoming You know, I'm thinking too, one of the problems that we're seeing is the with this, you know, you're talking about trauma when it's sort of being misused trauma and then the identity that goes around it. And so 
you're talking more about like actually meeting the suffering as an experience, actually allowing, not denying that you are feeling the thing that does feel bad. It's not sort of, no, you weren't hurt, but it's not forming an identity that becomes rigid around the experience. Yeah. Right. Right. I guess that my, my Buddhist background kind of shows through in this is that, um, and, and funnily enough, last week or the week before we were, I was trying to teach about the, the difference between compassion and empathy and that compassion really is the tool that we're using in therapy in order to not burn out and in order to not over identify with the client's suffering that we need to have this sort of, um, encompassing compassion. And I taught them a Buddhist practice called Tong Len. Has anyone done that? Yeah. So you, okay. Oh, yes. You, Yes. yes. And yes. it's it's so helpful because it it's also helpful when you don't know what to do with a client and you're kind of stuck and you're in the room. Um, you breathe in their suffering as a hot, dark, heavy substance, and you breathe out cool white light as a compassion. Mm -hmm. And you just sit there in it. And the, the teaching is that you recognize there's nowhere for this to stick. The hot, dark, heavy, it doesn't, there's no self really for it to stick but the brilliance of compassion is what soothes. And so it means that you're really present with the client, with whatever is happening in the room. And even that is healing. Yeah, I really like that. I have, um, I, I was trying to think of where, where did I hear this just recently? And it was actually, I was speaking with someone who was telling me, this is a thing that, that she does in order to, uh, it's a, it's a meditation that she uses when she's mm -hmm. suffering. Yeah. To yeah, breathe well, in the suffering yeah. of others and breathe out yeah. relief. And I thought it was so yeah. beautiful. She really went into it in detail. And I, I like this a lot. Um, a lot of wisdom there. Pema Chodron is the teacher who really focuses on this and her, I can't remember, I've read all of her books. And of course, I think it's the places that scare you is mm -hmm. where she really talks about the Tong Lin. Mm -hmm. You can practice it towards yourself as well. Yeah. I mean, you could envision yeah. yourself in front of yourself and suck in all of the darkness you mm. envision and pain in yourself. Yeah. And it gives that little extra space if you sort of feel like I can't deal with my own pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to go to the chat and read a little bit here. Mm. We've had some. Um, so let's see. 97 cents says, are the internships paid? Mm. So uh, I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. So it depends really on what the school will allow. Um, and the complexity of that. So right now I have an unpaid internship um, and the associateships. So that's after you graduate and you're working or towards hours for your full licensure. Those are paid and we okay. pay higher than anyone in our community. <laughs> well, that's good to know. That's yeah. great. All right. Uh, Dora Snedden says, ideological oasis sounds like a wonderful environment for therapist internship. Very inspiring. Mm. Uh, Ash Good. Brown suggests deactivated instead of deprogrammed or de oh. indoctrinated. I like that. Yeah, so like kind of that. When, you think, when you think about people being trained to be activists, yeah, it's kind of nice. I like that. <laughs> the uh, word decontaminated just came to yeah. my mind. And I started yeah. thinking about what you do when you're sprayed by a skunk, whatever that yeah. is. That's what we're trying <laughs> to do. It's the All social right. justice skunk. Well, and I think what you do chemically is you do an alkaline, so it neutralizes the acid. So that's interesting too, right? We're neutralizing. That's right. interesting. Yeah, I like that. Um, let's see. 97 cents says, I wonder how much that matches with the timing of anti-work in general. Yeah. Um, they're referring to the the bit about the pandemic attitude of, yeah. of clients or of interns. Can I say something about that? Because that was really striking in the pandemic was that people were, um, as I mentioned, we paid higher than anyone in the area. And that was true then as well. And it was all online and we were still paying rent, you know, and, and lockdown mm -hmm. and all that. Um, and what we found was that uh, in our, gosh, how not to get too in the weeds with this. With clinicians, there's always a sense that they feel full, like their caseload is full. Mm -hmm. And what's actually true is they're about 40% full and full is about 25 sessions a week. So as therapists generally work 25 hours a week. So, so a big, big picture here. Um, and so we would put new clients into their schedule because we need them to stay at 25 because we're a business and we need to operate and pay for supervision and insurance and all that stuff. Um, and they would not accept them. And so they would turn away clients, even though they had signed a contract that said they would work 25 hours because mm -hmm. they felt full. 
And then they were very upset that their paychecks were low. Hmm. So there was this, and I was just realizing this, I think it was this morning, I was just thinking about it, that there's such little grasp at that point of objective reality, that subjective reality is forefront. And if I feel like I am seeing enough clients, I therefore should be paid the same amount, even though I'm seeing half the amount I agreed to, that there, there's not really uh, room for objective reality to enter that equation. And I was like, oh, that's why it was so hard for them to understand. And they felt so upset that we kept giving them clients that they had agreed to see. Hmm. So that was just one little like a uh, real world expression of this confusion about subjective objective reality. Oh, that's so interesting. It's such a concrete example. Yeah. Yeah. The other one um, was no show fees. You know, no show fees are a very good clinical tool because it helps the client take accountability. Mm -hmm. um, if there's someone that has a hard time showing up and they, um, they learn that they need to just give us, we've got like five different ways to communicate. Just give mm -hmm. us 24 hours advance notice, unless you're sick or it's an emergency. And clinicians were refusing to charge no-show fees because it wasn't fair, but they were angry that they weren't getting paid. <laughs> and so it was this double bind where um, I was like, well, you, this is a fee for service model and you're not charging the client, where does the money come from? Like, <laughs> help me yeah. understand that. Well, that's and, interesting. I can see yeah. that as a problem with, uh, there was another comment that 97 mm -hmm. cents made when your goal is to just be liked, you're going yeah. to try to be likable. And so if you're confusing yeah. what you're doing mm -hmm. for being liked and getting approval, then it's really yeah. hard to challenge people and, yes. and telling somebody that they need to pay a no-show yeah. fee is a real, it's a real challenge. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult boundary. It's an initiation process that every therapist has to go through. It's like mm -hmm. I'm my time is worth this, and mm -hmm. you also are worth this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna save this time for you. And if mm -hmm. you don't show up, then there's a consequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, right? Is avoiding consequence and avoiding discomfort. I think in the pandemic, especially, we're we're the ultimate goal of allyship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm as a therapist. So I think, um, 97 cents, is that their name mm -hmm. <laughs> had a real, they noticed something there, right. Is that if you're going to befriend, then it, you're not going to set those boundaries because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cassandra Murray says, I'm a student at the other end of the spectrum and didn't care about being canceled. So I continued mm -hmm. to ask unfavorable questions. This was received as harassment. And that's when I stopped asking questions. Ooh. Oh, God. it's yeah. harassment. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. God. I, I just want to hug her. That that yeah. sucks. That is yeah. completely awful. To me, that's just the opposite of what education is meant to do. Yeah. Like broadening yeah. your mind, challenging mm -hmm. your beliefs and being able to challenge other people's beliefs. That's how you really come out. I think with a clear sense of who you are yeah. and who you are as a clinician, who you want to be as a clinician, what you're bringing to the table. It's just interrupting that whole process. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of those rhetorical tools. I wish I had it with me. It's like lesson number six or whatever. <laughs> and canceling of the American mind is that you make the person um, because it makes you uncomfortable. It means that you're being harmed. Right. And if you're being harmed, then that person is bad. And if that person is bad, then nothing they say is worth listening to. And therefore they need to be shut down. It's a terrible yeah. experience. Yeah. yeah. And in mm. keeping with that, Jonathan Lynch says, I couldn't be a student today. I wouldn't be able to keep my mouth shut. And I, yeah. when I read that, I think, well, maybe that's exactly who needs to be a student. Yeah. And then there's <laughs> also this yeah. also, what happened to being able to politely challenge things and be respectful, but disagree, disagree, disagree respectfully. It seems like what we have right now is this, this veil of perfect politeness and, and uh, a mm -hmm. complete, what, what do we even call this? It's like a, a complete and total collusion with the idea that's being presented until something strikes as offensive. And then there's a sharp attack so yeah. we've got these two paradigms at play. One is this, this um, almost sycophantic, polite, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and then the, but then the brutal, uh, cruel, uh, name calling nastiness of being, you, this, you're a racist, you're a bigot. Yeah. That's a microaggression. That's uh, there's an attack, but but what we seem to have lost is the art of respectful disagreement. 
Yeah. And that's what's missing in these. Like if you are a student and you can't keep your mouth shut, why shouldn't you be able to just continually ask questions yeah. as long as you're being respectful and open yeah. to the answer? It's, it seems like it's a lost art. I don't know how to describe that dynamic. I wonder if one of you has a better handle on that. I think you described it beautifully. And I keep thinking about feminism, actually, and what Louise Perry talks about so much and Mary Harrington and mm -hmm. reactionary feminism is that the um, that ability to collude and manipulate and, and collaborate, that is the, the strength in feminism, right, is that we don't have the physical prowess. So we create this culture that influences, we undermine, it's a skill. Um, but that somehow with the loss of um, actually valuing masculine approaches and uh, a masculine way of being, then of course, this sort of overly um, mm -hmm. colluding, manipulative feminist ideology is going to be valued and infiltrate. I mean, let's look at counseling programs that what are they? 75% women, um, uh, psychology programs are, I don't, I think the, the psychology professors is up in the sixties or seventies of women. Um, and they represent a particular, maybe Mary Harrington talks about, um, women that are uh, childless by choice or don't value motherhood and they have a particular message. So there's, you know, there's a, a healthy feminism that I think has been lost. And this is sort of the, the disempowered version. That's mm -hmm. how I think of it. That's what mm -hmm. comes to mind. You know, that's so interesting. And this is a conversation that Benjamin and I have over and over again about feminism. And I'm not somebody, I'm not trying to defend feminism because I, I'm a feminist or anything. I don't know that I am. I don't, I've never called myself that. I don't understand feminist philosophy all that well, because it's just never been that, it's never been that compelling for me to study it. So I, I'm going to confess some ignorance. And yet I do know plenty of women who would call themselves feminists who would absolutely be appalled by this kind of behavior. And I, I think that this pattern is something that has existed since, I mean, I think of the run-up, the, the antebellum period in the United States, mm -hmm. the way that manipulation and propaganda was used in order to divide people in the South Mm -hmm. There's there's a similar pattern of mm -hmm. devious, manipulative, um, mm -hmm. behind the scenes and uh, and sort of uh, echo chamber kind of, mm -hmm. uh, I guess I guess manipulation really of mm -hmm. people's minds that seems very similar. And I think that mm -hmm. these patterns are just a feature of organized collective action. And so mm -hmm. I, I yeah I do agree. I think that there are some really interesting observations around what happens with weaponized empathy and maybe childless women what mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are is there some connection there is there something to talk about when a field is dominated by by females does this tend to be a pattern we observe but i also really hesitate to come back and lay this at the foot of feminism mm -hmm. i i don't know what are y'all's thoughts on that did i just go really far afield no, I think there's something to this. And um, from, from people I've asked when they're on their college campus and there's this uh, sort of ideological capture and the wokeism, and I've asked people who seems to be buying into this ideology the strongest, and the answer is always that it's the female students. And I, I believe it, and I'm not therefore blaming feminism because, you know, it's something about the, I think females, we are biologically driven to be nurturers and nurturing can be misapplied. Mm -hmm. And I think as there's less and less emphasis and value placed on women being mothers and women nurturing in other ways, uh, the, how we nurture gets distorted and it also gets weaponized. Oh, well, mm -hmm. if there's a need that, and it's not being met, and if anybody has any unmet need, then something's being done to them. They're victims. It must be the mm -hmm. system. I think our sort of psychology and biology, um, can easily get funneled into unhealthy ways of being nurturing. Yeah. 
That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like the overemphasis on soothing every, mm-hmm. every harm as well, or every suffering. Um, yeah. I want to leave us enough room to discuss a couple of viewer comments. If you guys have some that are, that are up and ready. Um, I also wanted to say hi to Jen in the chat. Hi, Jen. And mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right, but Re- Rehinti says uh, the live stream needs even more puppy dog. So, <laughs> Cheers. And Kristen Cheers, puppy Mudra. Dog. Oh, my <laughs> there you go. Henry. So cute. <laughs> Kristen Mudra says, I found Leslie from her discussion with the plastic surgeon who was questioning DEI practices. I'm an American citizen who is so happy to find these pockets of sanity in a world gone crazy. We're glad you found us. Glad to have you here and hi ninja kitty and okay <laughs> so uh yeah do you guys have some comments you want to bring up and uh, i guess before we go to that karen this is so awesome i'm so glad you joined us to talk about this and i hope that we have a chance to maybe revisit this as as you get it going and find out how things are going and when i get contacted by students i'll be sure to recommend what you're doing Please, because I, I hope resource. to have a, a network of sane supervisors. Um, I'm kind of working on another website for a database where uh, clinicians and supervisees can connect. So, yeah, I was already thinking, like, how do we scale you? You know, <laughs> <Right. laughs> some of it is only your talent, and you can't, you know, that you can't make clone you. But yeah. oh no, please, yeah. <laughs> let's let's bring lots of people on board. Maybe you can make it a network at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Ninja Kitty, what about cats? Yeah, I, I can, you know, I can't, I can't have them in here when I'm doing this because they'll climb the screen and, uh, (laughs) you know, it's just (laughs) not so, um, so any good comments you guys have ready to go? I just had one from, it was more of a interesting phrase or concept that we might look at going forward. I forget it was two weeks ago. It looks like this was, um, it's just this sort of phenomenon of bad, bad, bad practices um, <laughs> getting worse in a certain sense. So someone said, I don't know if we were talking about uh, gender affirming care or what we were talking about, but probably it says the high percentage, this is from porch time 504. Um, the high percentage of continuance on a program is called therapeutic cascade. So you start mm-hmm. on a path of medicalization and you double down when you shouldn't have even started. It's a phenomenon in a lot of types of medical intervention overly high percentage of doubling down is actually a sign of it. So there's probably some different places where we're seeing this, that there, you know, let's throw more vaccine at somebody, let's take a booster, let's, you know, and so this therapeutic cascade concept, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I'm familiar with that from like the idea of obstetric medicine. Once you put the woman on Pitocin, she's much more likely to end up with a C-section, for instance. Mm -hmm. You start these processes and you, it's like a, your chances of further interventions just skyrocket. That's interesting. That's a great phrase. Think about the, um, the ritual abuse panic in the nineties, right? That, that was, panic. Yeah. That that's a similar therapeutic cascade um, that mm. went to a very unfortunate conclusion where people had implanted memories and there was the, uh, um, all of the the downsides of that for people that were victims of the therapy. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. that'd be interesting to talk about at length sometime. Yeah, oh, that's okay. a really good topic. That's fascinating. I grew up in the 90s, well, in the 80s. And um, right when John Bradshaw was, and I was in Houston and he, I was 18 and I went mm-hmm. to his inpatient treatment center when I was 18, mm. I was very depressed. And I met people there um, that had 400 altars and that were claiming ritual abuse. Cause that was the big, this, I think it was the Southeastern Texas corridor mm-hmm. was where this panic was really uh, located. And I'll, I'll never forget that experience of being in group therapy with these people that were having these memories and flashbacks. And wow, I'm sure. Oh gosh, influenced... Karen, would you talk to us about that sometime? Could we schedule <laughs> sure. to have you share that? Well, that's with us fascinating. More? Yeah, sure. I um, I would love to talk about that. I've never really talked about that time in my oh, life. But I'm. Wow. I have a a history of being a misdiagnosed as a teen and uh, really dealing with therapeutic cascade 
in the Mm. the 80s um, that I'm sure has informed my work today. Wow. That's amazing. That's really interesting. Mm. Well, do we have time for one more? Jennifer, do you have something? Um, from our video that we did a couple weeks ago about um, Gary Wilson's book, Your Brain on Porn, um, a commenter, I don't know how to pronounce it, o- Utegen. Oh, Utehegan, I think. She's the Ute-Hagen. trans widow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. She said, one detail from trans widows, we are advised by our now ex-husband's therapist that we need to try watching the porn they've been watching and try acting it out. No thanks. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and I, mm. I just want to say, I really, I feel... <laughs> a lot of sympathy for trans widows because not only are they losing their partner but often they're getting no support whatsoever it is kind of like a death although in some ways much more complicated instead of people rallying around you they're all trying to shame you and bully you into celebrating that your husband now wants to clomp around in your dress and if you don't want to do particular sex acts with him then you're this horrible bigoted person and it's your fault. The marriage is in decline. And Mm -hmm. I just, you know, it's just adding to an already really painful, confusing situation. Yeah. I feel so much pain about that. Um, Gosh. Okay. So I have a story about a supervisee and this Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was deeply involved in interviews and I, uh, had an online interview with someone, uh, an associate who popped in on the screen and I said, hi, welcome. Thanks for applying. I'd love to talk with you about the position. And she said, great. And I always like hearing what people's ideals are. Like, ideally, what do you want to do with your career? Like, what are your hopes and dreams? And, and she said verbatim, I want to uh, unwork the harmful Christian heteronormative uh, monogamous poison in couples therapy and uh, validate kink and Mm -hmm. sex culture in throuples. And I was like, is she reading this from a cue card? I was like, I was like, oh, that I said, oh, that's very specific, you know. And it was, and that that was, I'm laughing because it was just like, wait, wait, what? That is that is so um, not what my belief or what therapy is or what will really help. And, but what Mm -hmm. it really reminded me of is this person is going through school and she was in an LMFT program. So marriage and family therapy program. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how exciting it was that her family therapy program was so supportive of non-normative and offensive Christian Western values. And, Mm -hmm. um, sounds like Antioch. Well, I just thought, (laughs) I thought, wow, that's so explicit. Like I thought it would be a Mm -hmm. little more even underground, but no, they're really saying anti-Christian, anti-Western normative values. And I was thinking, well, um, my mind is just blown because we have the freedom to explore these ideas because of our Western normative Christian enlightenment values, <laughs> you know, a little bit of like, irony there. But, yeah. yeah. No kidding. And, well, and unfortunately this person went on to say, and I really want to talk, this is, I wanted to share this today. I really want to talk to um, parents of teens that are transitioning medically because my 15 year old son is transitioned medically and I want to teach oh. parents how to talk to their teens without harming them verbally. And I thought, yeah. you're not hearing how you're harming your child by medically transitioning them. Yeah. You're right. How they might yeah. be harmed by language. By language. And so, you know, yeah. I think as an example, that's a person I probably couldn't work with because no. I, the indoctrination They're dug in. is, yeah. is a whole other level. Yeah. They're a mm-hmm. trans. Um, it physicalized yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, I, I, I wish we had another hour, <laughs> <laughs> but it just, it goes to yeah. the therapist. What I heard in that yeah. in Uta Hagen's comment was that the therapist supported the fetish yeah, and that she was basically shamed in some way for not supporting the fetish. And there's this, this bias. Well, I know we have to wrap, but I will just say really quickly, you know, I'm not a 
I'm not a trans widow, but I do consider myself sort of a porn sex addiction widow. Mm. Yeah. There's things that mm. happened in my prior, yeah. in my, in my marriage, my last marriage. Mm. And um, when I found that my ex was deeply involved in sort of this kink world, the person that I, that I discovered was that she was a uh, studying to be a therapist and her, mm. Mm. her whole spiel as she communicated with me was about how she wanted to not kink shame and she needed to be open to all things. And there were these things and it was this very therapized mm. kind of language that I was hearing in my own program. And so this was really mm. shocking to, to see this acting out right there in front of me. And, it, and this yeah. person who trolls kink Reddit, forums to hook up with people in order to explore her own boundaries because she didn't even like this thing according to what she was telling me it was not even a thing she was interested in doing but she thought she needed to get over it Mm -hmm. because she had a she felt that resistance in herself so it was something she needed to go into yeah and she was this was in keeping with her studies so this was like a real life example of exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I don't mean to. Wow. This is, tra- personal, this is training. This is training people yeah. to feel actual shame for having boundaries exactly. and setting boundaries. Yeah. And we know that boundaries are our friends. So what we're probably <laughs> going to be seeing is a lot more sexual trauma. Yeah. Um, ourselves. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, so mm-hmm. I don't see that going anywhere good. Yeah. yeah. Ash Brown says this conversation needs a part two. Oh, so, yeah. 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 Yes, we have to have you come back, Karen. Please yeah, come Karen. Back again. Well, let's talk that. about that. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for a really great conversation. And thank you, Karen. I'll put the link to the um, Oasis, the ideological Oasis in the notes here. And if you have any other things that you want me to add, please just send them over and I'll link them up. Thank you. And 